with the uh, American Red Cross's uh, IHL team at our national headquarters here in DC. Thank you all so much for being here today. This event is being put on in partnership with the American Red Cross's International Humanitarian Law and Restoring Family Links programs. The IHL program works to disseminate information about IHL and other areas of law that relate to armed conflict. Uh, and this is done by events like today and through the efforts of volunteers who teach foundational IHL courses in their communities. Restoring Family Links works to provide free and confidential services to help families reconnect who have been separated due to armed conflict, international disasters, and various other catalysts that cause migration and displacement. So making that program very relevant to our discussion today. Both programs would not be possible without the dedication and work of volunteers. So if you wanna become involved, please contact your local American Red Cross region. You can find your local American Red Cross region by entering your zip code at the uh, link that should now be in the chat. And information about each of these programs um, at the, will also be uh, available through links in the chat as well. And uh, today you're joining us for a panel discussion with professors Jane McAdam and Walter Kalin. And this discussion will cover the crucial and even existential issue of the current state of international law and whether it is equipped to respond to uh, growing displacement as a result of climate change. So starting with Professor uh, Jane McAdam, AO, is the Santa Professor of Law and Director of the uh, Andrew and Renata Calder Center for International Refugee Law at the University of New South Wales. Professor McAdam is a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, a research associate at Oxford University's Refugee Studies Center, an associated senior fellow at the Nansen Institute in Norway and a senior research associate at the Refugee Law Initiative in London. <gasps> Gonna take a breath there. Professor McAdam is also a non-resident senior fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution uh, in Washington, DC, as well as a visiting professor at Harvard. And in the fall of 2022, we will be welcoming Professor McAdam back to the United States, uh, virtually or in person. Maybe you can speak to that professor when uh, in, in, in a second. Uh, but we're going to we're happy to have you either way back here at, at an institution you may have heard heard NYU as a global professor of law. Also, you may have noticed that at the end of uh, my introduction for Professor McAdam, I said AO, and that is because she was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia for a distinguished service to international refugee law, particularly to climate change and the, and the displacement of people. Professor Kalin is a professor emeritus for international and Swiss constitutional law at the University of Bern in Switzerland. He is the present envoy of the chair of the platform on disaster displacement, a position he's held since July of 2017, and the former envoy of the Nantian Initiative on disaster-induced cross-border displacement. Professor Kalin also served as representative of the UN General Secretary General on Human Rights, pretty big deal, uh, of internally displaced person, and as a member of the H UN Human Rights Committee uh, uh, from 2003 to 2008 and 2012 to 2014. And in the 1990s, Professor Kalen chaired, chaired the expert uh, group drafting guiding principles on internal displacement and later led the process resulting in the 2010 IASC framework on durable solutions, conditions uh, in the context of climate change, which uh, Professor Kalen still works. Now, um, some of the people, Professor McAdam, I'm gonna start with you. Some of the people um, that, um, that might have heard, but I, I want to mention again is that you're actually not just our uh, professor from University of New South Wales or our panelist, you're our panelist from the future. And I just wanted to let you know if you could uh, assure our 1117 guests that we're, we're all going to see November 18th, climate change won't get us in the next 12 to 24 hours, but we're going to be, we're going to make it. I'm here in the future. It's the 18th. You'll be fine. Oh, thank you. Okay. If uh, all of our uh, 1117 audience members can can at least sleep well tonight. Um, thank you, by the way, Professor, for tolerating that lame joke at 7 a.m. for you. <laughs> and even funny jokes aren't funny at that time. So I appreciate uh, you tolerating that. <laughs> okay, but considering this is a serious topic, uh, we'll get started on that. Um, so uh, Professor McAdam, you started working on these issues back in 2007, and this was shortly after the uh, Intergovernmental Panel uh, on climate change, fourth assessment report was released. Can you explain why that timing was so critical for you, that you felt to get involved in this field and how the field has developed over the past 15 years? 
Thanks, Eric. I, I can do that. But before I do, I'd like to thank you very much for having me to this panel discussion. It's a great pleasure to be here in the future, as you said, um, and, and I very much look forward to it. Yeah, so why 2007? Why, why then? Why me? Well, it was actually a couple of months um, prior to that end of 2006, I recall that a community radio station rang me up and they said, could you do an interview on environmental refugees? And I thought, oh, well, that's easy because legally there's no such thing. And I was, you know, I went through the interview, explained why refugee law wasn't necessarily a great fit, but was quite dismissive of the idea. There'd been scholarship in the 90s about this and it hadn't really gone all that far. But it was the following year, and as you said, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out their report where they, actually, they acknowledged the impacts of global warming on displacement and, and population movements. Um, I also became more aware in my own region, there was a lot of media around so-called sinking island states, uh, not a, a term that those countries embrace, but nonetheless, it was about well, what, what's the, the future of countries like Tuvalu and Kiribati and the Pacific low-lying atolls. And for me, it prompted the question, well, if people, are, and I was thinking back to that radio interview, and I thought, well, if there's no such thing as an environmental refugee, what international legal protections do exist for people who have to leave their homes because of the impacts of climate change or disasters? And that really set me off on a, a track that I've never, <laughs> never left. Um, and in terms of the developments, I will, no doubt we'll canvas many of them during the course of the discussion. But I think back then, uh, some of the things I remember very starkly were that initially you'd begin any discussion um, by saying, well, I'm not an expert on climate change, but, but this is the stuff I do know about. And we were still grappling with how different is climate change as a driver of movement compared to other things. And what we've clearly discovered since is that climate change on its own doesn't drive movement. It always interacts with other drivers like poverty, violence, conflict, human rights violations, um, environmental fragility. So it's multi-causal as a phenomenon. Um, we know now that most movement is within countries, not across borders. So that also has implications for the role of international law. Um, but I think too, it was the time very much of climate denial, not to say that we've completely left that, but every talk was prefaced or, you know, every interaction was about, well, you know, do you believe in climate change? What if climate change isn't real? And I think what, something that uh, perhaps Professor Kalen will speak to a little bit was this shift slightly towards looking at disasters, which partly was perhaps political because climate change was such a, uh, you know, hot potato. But I think what it did was it enabled the heat to, to be taken out of the, the you know, politicization of climate change to be able to say, well, whatever's behind this, uh, you can see there's this cyclone, there's this flood, there's this wildfire. What do we do when people can't remain in their homes? I might leave it there for now. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. And so I have actually followed your work for a couple of years now. I've, I've read a lot of your, uh, I've read a lot of your um, written work and I've, I've heard you speak on several platforms and, and one, one term, and you actually mentioned it, not really, but in sort of a way there, but one term that, that comes up a lot is the term climate refugees. Uh, it's a term often referred to people, by people in both the media as well as some advocacy groups. Um, and I just, and if I hadn't buried the lead, I was wondering if you'd comment as to whether that term is accurate as a matter of, of law. If so, why? And if not, why not? So as a matter of law, like environmental refugees, climate refugees, climate change refugees isn't a thing. <laughs> However, there are certainly refugees who are moving in the context of climate change. And again, I think that's where the, the analysis has become more nuanced. Um, you know, the, the traditional way of, of breaking it down, um, which is, is still true to some extent, but, but I think doesn't capture everything was, well, climate change, to be, to be a refugee, you need to be outside your country. So of course, most people, as I've explained, are displaced within their own country. But for those who are outside, um, have a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership of a particular social group. And essentially your government's not able to, or willing to help you. Now, the, the challenge there was, well, you know, how could climate change constitute persecution as that's understood by um, 
you know, uh, legislatures and by courts, tribunals. Um, and even if they would accept that, then how would you show it was for reason of race, religion, nationality, or so on, when the impacts of climate change, you know, basically affect everybody. Um, and very often governments want to help people. And in fact, in Kiribati and Tuvalu in the Pacific, people were very, um, you know, they really rejected this concept of the climate refugee because they said, well, which is actually unfortunate the way they framed it, but understandable. They said, we're not victims. We don't want handouts. We don't need to be supported by the international community. We are active members of a community who want to contribute elsewhere. Now I'd argue refugees do that, but I understood that framing. For them, it wasn't about needing protection. It was, and they said, we love our government. We want its help. So it was a very different concept there. Um, where we've kind of got to in more recent years, um, and the work of Matthew Scott has, I think, been very helpful in this, has been to say, well, disasters are not natural. Hazards are natural, but disasters aren't. They are a so social, economic, political phenomenon. And in fact, disasters, um, you know, they, they can be linked and very often are, um, the, the effects of them are, um, exacerbated for particular groups and the impacts of them can amount to persecution. And likewise, you know, some of the earlier decisions, particularly in New Zealand, were talking about contexts where climate change and displacement, it wasn't the displacement as such that would necessarily render somebody, um, sorry, it wasn't the climate change, you know, per se that would render somebody without a place to live, but it was that broader context. So also there were cases where in Myanmar, somebody was um, delivering aid after Cyclone Nargis and was persecuted by the government for doing that. So that backdrop provided a context for founding a refugee claim. So I think, you know, as I said, legally it's problematic, um, but refugee law in, in a small number of cases may apply, but not through that lens. Um, but I think, one, as I said, one of the strongest things for me in terms of the, the terminology was its very strong rejection by um, people to whom it was being applied. Great, thank you. Uh, that's really interesting. I actually um, was only vaguely aware of how the laws developed so that socioeconomic and political factors have sort of defined um, how you can legally, um, you know, in a term or, or classify victims of both of climate induced disasters. That's that's incredibly, incredibly interesting. Uh, Sorry, if I could just jump in, I've, I meant to mention UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency sure. in October 2020, um, put together what they call legal considerations on this issue. And they too adopted this, this framing. So if people are interested in, in looking at how it's, you know, in a short form, how it's being uh, analyzed, that, that's a good place to go. Oh, great, great, thank you. Yeah, um, that, <laughs> it strikes me as something where, you know, because international customary law is basically developed over a course of time that, um, but, but based on, you know, state practice and, 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 and international legal uh, scholarship and, and international opinion juris, as they say. And so it's almost like, you know, these sort of developments are just the way international law has developed. Um, but I want to get uh, ask a question really to both of you. And uh, Professor McAdam, we can start with you, uh, but if or unless you think Professor Kalen would be better suited to start and then move in and, and then you, you come in after. Um, I wanted to know if you could tell us about uh, the uh, the UN Human Rights Committee's view in um, Teotihuacan versus New Zealand and its significance. And then if you could discuss how uh, the role of, interna of international human rights law plays in decisions like this, or maybe the development of uh, the law surrounding climate induced migration displacement um, more generally. I'm, ha I'm happy to, but I wonder if we should bring in Professor Kalen, potentially yes, yes. since he was once on the human rights committee. So it's very much uh, apprised of how it, how it all operates. Absolutely. Professor Kalen, could, would you mind commenting on, on that case and the sort of the larger questions that international human rights law presents in this okay. field? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, but as a kind of preliminary uh, remark, if uh, refugee law only applies in exceptional situations, IHL as uh, the law of armed conflict still has some bearing, but uh, it doesn't really apply, then we have to turn to human rights law. And it's not just uh, Teotihuacan. If you're looking back again at um, how things uh, developed, um, it um, 
I would say started out with internally displaced uh, persons, IDPs. Um, I, um, as you had mentioned, uh, was involved in um, drafting uh, the so-called UN guiding principles of internal, uh, internal displacement. And when we were discussing who is an IDP, we um, came up with the idea that's not only people who are displaced in the context of conflict, but also those displaced uh, in the context of human-made and natural disasters, as we uh, called it uh, then. But in the initial years, in the 1990s, this didn't really play a role. I um, was appointed uh, representative of the Secretary General on the Human Rights of IDPs in 2000. Uh, uh, for in um, November. And I remember I woke up on the 26th, turned on the radio, and this was the uh, India Ocean tsunami. And I immediately realized this is, of course, it was not climate change, but the mega disaster. And human rights of those who survived, who are displaced, will be affected all over the place. I went to the region and uh, fact finding showed in fact that as in many other dis uh, uh, disasters, uh, IDPs need protection and that's basically human rights uh, protection. And that's internal and that's a majority. On average, uh, more than 24 million people are newly displaced every year in the context of sudden onset disasters, most of them 80-90% weather and climate related. Okay, but then there are of course those who uh, are displaced or flee across borders. And there the question of course is one of admission. And we don't have a human rights to be admitted to another country. But when people make it across a border, then the question arises whether they could be sent back. And that's where Teichiota comes in. Uh, Mr. Teichiota with his family came to New Zealand, applied for asylum with the argument that he and his family had been suffering as a consequence of sea level rise, eroding coastlines, reduced uh, food uh, security, but then also fights among people over diminishing resources. Uh, for the reasons uh, Professor McAdam just mentioned, his asylum claim was rejected. So he also made the argument that the right to life would protect him because he would be sent to a life-threatening situation. And that's where the Human Rights Committee comes in. Again, looking back a little bit, when I was on the committee in uh, 2002, we adopted what is called the general comment on the right to life. That's a document simply bringing together the uh, case law of the Human Rights Committee, which can decide individual cases. It's non-binding decisions, but still it's individual cases and synthesize it. And they're based on their uh, practice, mainly uh, applied to rejected asylum seekers who were going to be deported. It uh, said that the duty to respect and ensure the right to life requires state parties to refrain from deportation in uh, cases um, uh, if there is, uh, are substantial grounds for believing that the real risk exists, that the right to life would be violated. You also said the risk must be personal. Uh, it cannot uh, be derived merely from the general conditions in the receiving state except in the most extreme cases. Now, Teichota's lawyer um, was uh, arguing that this formula applied to his client. Um, the uh, judge, the immigration judge in New Zealand, Bruce McPherson, accepted that argument. But he said conditions are not such that the situation is serious enough that this already amounts to a life-threatening situation despite all the difficulties. So in the end, uh, the case was lost and the lawyer brought the case through the instances up to the Human Rights Committee. The Human Rights Committee basically um, took the same as, approach as uh, the New Zealand court. And uh, they, uh, again, quoting what I just said from the general comment, 
said, yes, we have to look at whether there is a life-threatening situation. And what before was applied to things like killings, murder, sometimes crime, etc., now was applied to an environmental situation, which was a first big step, an important step. But the inherent logic of what they said, hmm? general conditions in the receiving state, except in the most extreme cases. The uh, committee accepted that uh, the um, uh, that a situation where a whole country could become submerged under water is an extreme situation. And that's why this uh, duty to respect and ensure the right to life applies. But then again, they said, not in the next 15 years. Uh, the uh, government, the international community are doing their best. And uh, it's not like that, that you would now be uh, threatened. But the interesting thing, again, is they did not say it has to be an imminent risk. They said conditions can become such that even before the, right, uh, before the risk to life becomes imminent, you already can invoke uh, the um, protection and the right to life. So we'll see where this first step will lead us, how it will be taken up by uh, domestic jurisdictions, and how this case law will uh, evolve. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. That's that is that is the history of how um, the interplay between sort of these even the non-binding uh, international organizations and the, you know their uh, various declarations and, and, opi and legal opinions and how that interplays with state practice and uh, the and, dom and domestic courts is incredibly interesting and, and something I actually want to get into um, in a bit. But at first, I just wanted to ask Professor McAdam. Um, do, you, do, you, do you have any comment on how human rights law can be used to respond to climate-induced displacement? Anything to add to what uh, Professor Kalin uh, laid out just then? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, one thing I would say, uh, just reflecting on the case, is that what's interesting is that Mr. Tesiota had been in New Zealand already for some time, and the, the background is he'd, he'd overstayed a visa. Um, he'd been working there with, with his wife. He'd then applied for asylum as a, uh, well, he'd applied for asylum and then he'd, you know, been removed. And I think what that shows is that, and that, I'm not suggesting that there was something, you know, wrong about doing that at all, um, because quite clearly he articulated a, a, a claim. But what I do think it shows is that, you know, the, the root of protection um, on an individual basis is is really quite an imperfect one. Obviously, it needs to be there, but we also need to have policies that enable people to migrate or to remain, um, you know, and that's, I think, the, the bigger question, and I think we'll come to it a bit later on. The US has just, um, the, the White House just released a big report on this, suggesting the need for more systematic policies. Just on the human rights point, um, I mean, as Professor Kalen said, there was, in many respects, there was nothing startling about the, the reasoning of the decision. It, it was along the lines of what many scholars had been saying for years, which is that the principle of non um, you know, well, it wasn't just scholars, there's broadly accepted practice that the principle of non um, you know, prevents people from being returned to a real risk of arbitrary deprivation of life or torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Um, I think what the the Human Rights Committee did here was the analysis was virtually confined to the right to life aspect. Um, another point that they, they mentioned in passing but didn't really analyse was uh, when would a situation on the ground amount to inhuman or degrading treatment such that, you know, people, it wouldn't be um, right for people to return because they couldn't survive or, or situation is so dire, um, you know, no shelter or in, insufficient shelter water, food, and so on. Um, and the other thing that would have been interesting to see a bit more on is the rights of the child. Now, part of, part of this is simply because of what was put to the committee, um, but in other cases, really, you know, drawing out well, what does the best interest of the child require? What does the Convention on the Rights of the Child require? Again, not a matter for the Human Rights Committee. Um, but I think that's where in New Zealand too, this case and um, another case about Tuvalu have looked at those questions a little more. And in New Zealand too, there's a, a kind of humanitarian um, 
discretion to allow people to stay. So there was a case there about Tuvalu. Again, on the facts, the family wasn't precluded from being returned, but because of their longstanding um, relationships and, and time in New Zealand, the decision maker said, well, on compassionate grounds, you can stay. So again, this is where national courts and policies, you know, it's going to be very different in different contexts. Australia doesn't have that residual discretion, for instance. So if someone didn't meet the test, then they'd, they'd have to go back. Okay, that's great. And that, that's going to lead me into my next question um, or set of questions uh, for Professor Kalen. But I, I think one thing that's interesting, one thing that struck me in the context of um, how these, these courts have ruled and, and the, how the principle of non refoulement non plays and, and, or non return plays into it all is has to do with sort of the uh, prohibition of returning somebody where their life is at risk and for all the other. Uh, reasons for, pers uh, for persecution reasons, but in the international humanitarian law context, and I understand we're talking about human rights law, but you sort of see that in the um, uh, unwilling and unable uh, doctrine that is like, you know, if, if a country is unwilling and unable to handle a threat deemed by, an, or deemed as an imminent threat to the national security of a particular country, then that justifies um, a, a, uh, a military action. And, and I'm not commenting on the, validity of that or, or anything else other than to say that it, it sort of reminds me of the same sort of thing. If a, if a, if a state is unwilling or unable to um, handle uh, or, you know, handle a climate related or any related disaster or hazard, does the in, incoming or asylee country um, have the responsibility to provide some sort of protection? And, and that seems to be what, what this topic is getting at. I just thought it was interesting, the relationship to armed conflict there a little bit. Um, so, but I, one thing also that's incredibly interesting is the state, is the area of how state practice comes into all this. And that's where I wanna bring in uh, Professor Kalin again. So, um, Professor Kalin, you, um, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the uh, Nansen Initiative Protection Agenda? And it also talks about a toolbox approach. So I was wondering if you could explain that. Happy to do that, but uh, what you just said about the IHL um, is, is interesting. And in a way, uh, the uh, Human Rights Committee implicitly had a parallel argument because uh, it uh, said uh, there that um, in the coming years, the Republic of Kiribati, with the assistance of the international community, would be able to take affirmative measures to protect and, where necessary, relocate its population. Mm. So the aspect of uh, the importance of international support to such countries who are unable to cope with the situation, but then also uh, what is required, the willingness of that government uh, in cooperation with the international community to do what is still possible in such uh, situations. But now to the uh, Nansen Initiative. Um, an important uh, step again, and we are really talking that's why we are both looking back. Uh, we are talking about, I would say, important historical developments. Probably looking back at what happened in the past uh, 20 years from now on, towards the end of the century, one would say this was the beginning of, of lots of very interesting developments. Uh, in that context, we do have to mention what is called the Cancun climate change um, agreement, 2010. Uh, this was the first time when uh, during a conference of uh, parties uh, to the UNF, C recognized that forced displacement, voluntary migration and planned relocation are part of the challenges to adapt and to cope with uh, the impacts of climate change. Uh, the question then, it was just three lines. So the question then was where to take it from there and attempts, uh, particularly by the High Commissioner for Refugees, to start a discussion within the UN failed. Governments didn't want to discuss. So uh, Norway and Switzerland uh, suggested and took the initiative to um, start with a um, process of consultations bottom up, going to the uh, affected regions, learning from the situations, and then come up with kind of a concept. And the concept was, when are people displaced in the context of 
be it your physical or weather related or climate related disasters. There are three elements. First, the hazard. It can be a sudden onset hazard, tropical storm, it can be a slow onset hazard, a drought. But people are only displaced if they are exposed to that hazard. And if at the same time, they are too vulnerable to withstand the impact of that hazard. Now, this is a great entry point for policy. And because law is weak, we have to focus on policy as, as Jane McAdam just uh, said. We can try to reduce the hazard. Uh, that's of course implementation of the Paris Agreement, reduction of um, greenhouse gas emissions. COP26 was, yeah, not that successful to say the least uh, in making uh, progress uh, on that. But still, we have to do it. And um, there's a lot, of course, as we know, of activities still ongoing, regardless of what came out of COP. Second, we can uh, try to reduce vulnerability. And that's helping people to stay. This is about climate change adaptation. This is about disaster risk reduction. And we can help to help, uh, we can help people to move out of harm's way so that they are not exposed. This is about measures such as planned relocation or um, opening up migration pathways for safe, regular migration to other countries. So we do have lots of tools and our message and the protection agenda was um, endorsed by more than 100 states is now also referenced in the Global Compact on Migration. So quite universally accepted. Uh, what uh, it means is there is a growing consensus. We need all these instruments, all these tools at the same time. And we cannot just focus either on helping people to stay or just on creating a climate refugee status. And that's the toolbox uh, approach. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Um, so you sort of got into this a little bit, and I, so I want to, but I want to follow up on a few things here. Um, the uh, I just wanted to know whether you feel as though uh, migration law, and I mean migration law is sort of you know it's got the the International Migration Organization for Migration, and you know the various and you know agreements that are can be considered at di differing levels of binding um, or uh, widely accepted and, and thus more binding. But um, I was wondering a lot. A lot of this is state. Practice. I mean, it's it's hard to say, you know, whether you know, depending on the political forces in a specific country, whether their migration policy is going to be adequate to shoulder the burden of taking people in who face real risk of of serious harm or death if they return to their home country. So, I was hoping you could comment on whether migration law will um, can provide opportunities for people to move in the context of climate change, and also, uh, Professor Kalin. You mentioned migration pathways. I, I, I want to focus on uh, something like free um, movement agreements and, and whether they play a role. Okay, uh, when we're looking at international migration law mm -hmm. at the global level, we mm -hmm. have very little. Of course, we have uh, the uh, Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers and their families, but um, they don't say anything about admission. Uh, and then it's really about economic migrants. So that's um, not an instrument that is very helpful. And it's also ratified by a rather small number of states, particularly not by uh, destination states. Um, if you're looking at regional levels, it already looks better. And there you're uh, mentioning, um, uh, you're mentioning free movement uh, of persons. We have um, in different regions uh, agreements and binding agreements on free movements of persons. Again, uh, the um, purpose is an economic one. Workers should uh, be able to go there. There are jobs. But uh, first, we have seen that these free movement agreements, and sometimes they are um, regional, like in Europe, like in Western Africa with ECOWAS, sometimes they are bilateral like uh, between uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia. 
that they have been used by survivors of disasters. Um, for instance, um, when there is drought or flooding in Western Africa, people regularly move across borders. Very often it's family members uh, looking for jobs in the big cities and then being able to send back remittances, thus helping uh, families, communities uh, to survive. When in 2010, the Christchurch earthquake in um, New Zealand, again, we saw a number of people migrating to uh, Australia from that region really going up. But these are not instruments that very specifically address the needs of those who um, are displaced across borders, usually um, important, difficult uh, to meet, uh, sometimes documentation requirements, passport, etc. Interesting development, uh, the uh, IGAT region, that's the Horn of Africa sub-regional African organization. They uh, recently adopted a, a protocol on free movement of persons, again, legally binding, not yet in force. And it contains a specific article saying that people who are my, uh, moving across borders in anticipation during or in the aftermath of a disaster can profit from free movement of persons. And if they don't have documents that otherwise are required, then they will be registered. So that's an example. Interestingly enough, I recently have been um, contacted um, by people who are in the process of helping to draft a model law for the free movement of persons agreement in the um, uh, East um, Organization of East Caribbean States. And they uh, would like now to get such a, a provision, again, based on their sub-regional free movement of persons agreement into uh, their model law that has to be adopted by states. We'll see whether governments will accept it in their early stages. But I mean, that's quite, quite interesting. Then we have to go down to the um, domestic level. And what we have identified is a lot of practice in terms of domestic laws and policies. Uh, for instance, um, we found back then in 2015 that um, 53 states had admitted people who had survived uh, disasters, usually sudden onset disasters, sometimes also drought. There are more. And in Central America, we have supported um, the uh, regional consultation on migration there in uh, developing a guide to effective practices. Those countries are interested to harmonize their laws. And the same has now happened in, in uh, South America. So we again see some movement. And that's why, of course, that we are really in, in, in the face of a development. We don't, we are not there yet, but it's moving into the right direction. I will take the right direction. Uh, maybe that's because I, you know, am sitting pretty safe from the worst effects of climate change. But I think with <laughs> with every, with all of the news out there, ending with the right direction is a, a supremely optimistic way to, to end a, a comment. Um, I would I would find it interesting uh, to know how how COVID has affected uh, free movement. Um, um, could could you comment on that? Is that has that been a a, a difficult uh, impediment? Of course, uh, it has been a difficult period for everyone, um, not only for people affected by climate change, but I also think for people who are really persecuted, uh, who would need refugee protection and, and, and asylum. Uh, but of course, then again, we, we hope to sooner or later overcome uh, this uh, situation. And uh, even during COVID, uh, if we had had people, I am don't have any information on that, uh, who crossed uh, borders. No, I have information. There was a case um, in Malawi uh, recently where neighboring countries uh, during uh, flooding accepted people and hosted them despite COVID. So the question of whether they um, should be sent back or where they must not be sent back, when we're coming back to the TTO, to right to life approach, would also apply uh, in these situations. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor McAdam, I'm gonna to turn to you. Uh, in uh, Professor Kalin's last comment, he mentioned, uh, he mentioned planned uh, relocations. And I just wanted um, 
to know because planned relocations are often described as a measure of last resort in the context of uh, climate induced displacement. And, and I wanted to know, is there much state practice in this area of forced relocation or if you can expand upon that? Yes, and, and just before I do, I think on that COVID point, um, where we've seen, I mean, obviously, as Professor Kalen said, it's it's posed a huge um, problem in so many ways, but in evacuations, there have, you know, governments have had to say to people, yes, we know co there's COVID, but actually get out of the way right now, you've got to evacuate because that's the more immediate risk to you. Um, but, but there have been cases where people have been too scared. And so, you know, this compounding or cascading, um, these, what would I call it, you know, cascading disasters, that's likely to be the new normal and how we deal with those, um, you know, just adds yet another challenge <laughs> into the mix. When it comes to planned relocations, um, there have actually been hundreds of them, but they've virtually all been within countries, not across borders. And I think very often people imagine the planned relocation as the population of a you know, small island state moving elsewhere. And while there have been some historical, about four historical examples of exactly that happening, albeit not the whole population of a country, but you know, a large population of one island moving to an island in another country, and I can touch on that in a moment. Um, other than those, pretty much every planned relocation has occurred within countries. And um, colleagues of, of ours uh, that worked with both myself and Professor Kalen, um, Erica Bauer and Sanjul Awarasinga, uh, earlier this year released a report that was commissioned by the Caldor Centre at UNSW and by the Platform on Disaster Displacement. It's called Leaving Place, Restoring Home. And they mapped from 1970 onwards, um, 300 cases of internal relocation. Um, definitionally, of course, this is you know, fraught. So the way they described it was it was where a group or community had moved permanently um, from you know, one site to another, but they said spatially, it's not just as simple as people in place X move to people in place B. You can get different communities moving to one spot or moving to a variety of different places. Um, and what they, they looked at about 30 cases in more detail um, so that if people are keen to know, well, you know, what does it look like, then I'd, I'd certainly commend that study to them. But broadly speaking, what they found was that um, most communities didn't move more than two kilometres. So we're not talking about these massive, um, you know, dislocations. But that said, um, for some groups, particularly Indigenous groups, which comprised about half of, of those 300 cases. Even a, a two kilometre distance can be an enormous rupture from traditional land. And in some parts of the world, like the Pacific, those land tenure issues are a huge impediment to who can move where and whether there's land to, to move to. Um, in terms of timeframes, they said, you know, some moves took under a year, some took 50 years. Um, so there's no clear time frame. And in terms of the numbers involved, in one place they looked at in Fiji, four households moved. In another context, there were a thousand moving. So it, it's really varied. What, what I think is um, fascinating is that in terms of what's happening now, it's, it's affected communities, it's affected countries leading the way. So Fiji established its own policy documents on internal relocations in the context of climate change. And a number of those have already happened. They also established a trust fund because this stuff is very expensive and is another obstacle to communities moving. So New Zealand, the New Zealand government put, um, I think it was $2 million, New Zealand dollars, I think, into that. Um, but it's quite a, a novel way of saying, well, look, we're, we're stuck, we need help. We're, we're just gonna set it up and we'd like your support. Um, Vanuatu also has internal relocation guidelines. Um, Solomon Islands is in the process of preparing those. You know, Bangladesh has policy on this. So, um, you know, it, it, those the, the most affected countries are really leading the way. And just before I end this um, part, I, I did wanna come back to the cross-border relocations I mentioned. So um, the ones I know most uh, closely, I've done field work in the communities that they moved to back in the 90s, uh, 
I didn't do the field work back in the 1940s. <laughs> I feel like I did sometimes. Uh, the communities moved back in the 1940s and they moved from what is now present day Kiribati and present day Tuvalu to islands in Fiji that at the time they, they bought the islands. Um, in the case of the people from Kiribati, some very um, novel constitutional arrangements were set up so that they would retain parliamentary representation back in Kiribati. Um, they could take up citizenship of, of Kiribati, even though they some of them have never been there. Um, they are now all citizens of Fiji. They have a, a local government there. Um, notwithstanding all this though, there are very strong um, feelings of injustice some 70 odd years on, a feeling that they were um, not told the full truth about why they were moved. Um, essentially, the British, New Zealand and Australian governments wanted to mine their home island completely for phosphate, but they were told that the Japanese destroyed their island during the war when they'd been temporarily mo moved away from it and therefore it wasn't safe to go back. Um, so although some consent was given, it was consent in uh, circumstances where they didn't have the full truth. And although that community received royalties from phosphate mining and at one point had considerable amounts of money, um, that that hasn't, you know, that hasn't solved it either. The, the legal developments haven't solved it. The, you know, the sense of injustice if people aren't fully part of the decision, the participatory processes to move. And for me, that just signals if if we don't do it properly, you know, you're only going to see these um, disastrous situations in the future where people feel they've lost their rights, they, they don't have um, the capacity to decide what happens to them or their community. Wow, I, it, it's astounding to me to know that so much of this, um, these problems, particularly with planned relocation uh, effects in such a negative way, uh, the indigenous communities of I mean, particularly uh, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. And that's something that I think should be far more focused on um, as a, not just in, you know, in, I mean, it is somewhat niche in the terms of it's dealing with a specific problem within a problem within a problem, but it's just so important and the injustice is so glaring that I, I feel like it's, it's, got, it's gotta be focused on more. Um, but thank you for that explanation on plan re relocations. Um, so uh, we are running out of time and it's been so interesting. I've learned so much and I, I feel quite sure the audience has as well. Um, so I'm, I, I want to just ask you both a couple more questions. Uh, and uh, for those in the audience, um, if we don't have time to get into too much question and answer with the audience, particularly um, my colleague Christian Jorgensen can put both of our emails in the chat and please feel free to email us with the questions. Um, but I had a question for both of you and, and um, wh whomever uh, would like to start. Uh, well, maybe you can start with Professor McAdam or Professor Kalins, which, which whoever wants to start. But uh, you both were instrumental in inter the International Law Association's Sydney Declaration of Principles on the Protections of Persons Displaced in the Context of Sea Level Rise. And I think we all know that international agreements are famous for how they roll off the tongue. Um, but can, can you explain um, what does this document do and what uh, has this, the, this impact been? And, and Professor McAdam, let's start with you. Yes, we were both involved in, in drafting this um, so-called Sydney Declaration. Um, it was an initiative that came through the International Law Association's Committee on Sea Level Rise. Um, part of the mandate is looking, it still exists, is looking at um, the you know, maritime law issues. Um, and we were looking at the, these questions of what happens to people who, who are affected by sea level rise. In essence, what we were seeking to do was really set out a body of well-reasoned principles in international law to um, you know, provide well, what is the state of the law and, and what could it be? So some of it is, is forward looking, but not just pie in the sky, this is what we think it should be. Um, really just develop, you know, taking those developments through to their logical conclusion. Um, it's, it begins with the premise that, as Professor Kalen said, most people don't want to leave their homes. So we're not saying, okay, everyone out you go and this is how you do it. It's how do we ensure that to the extent possible people can remain when it's safe to do so. And that's what they want. But then it also goes through you know, some of the things we've talked about, um, 
where refugee law would or wouldn't apply, how human rights law is applicable. Um, I noticed a question, a couple of questions in the chat relating to statelessness. Um, and, and very briefly um, on that point, the statelessness regime is not a well-fitting one. Um, from a pra purely practical point of view, um, the statelessness treaties are not well ratified and most countries don't have a process in place to identify someone who is stateless. But putting that to one side, um, you know, the, and this is something the committee's looking at at the moment is when would statehood cease to exist because of an ex existential threat like climate change? And, you know, it's very unlikely the international community would readily accept that it had effectively through its actions, you know, destroyed one of its own. Um, even if we were to try and reverse engineer it on the creation of states, let's go backwards, you know, what if you don't have territory, defined population and a, a government? Long before territory itself is uninhabitable, people are going to have to move. So in fact, that too raises questions a bit like some of the ones in the planned relocation scenario I mentioned before, of if, if you've got large numbers of a community living elsewhere, uh, can they establish themselves as a political entity? What would it look like? Could there be a government in exile? So these, these are ongoing questions, but the statelessness regime is, is not well fitting. Um, so that's quickly to sort of answer the questions in the chat. Um, but we also then looked in the principles at, at migration, at planned relocation. And, and as I say, really just to set out the, the baseline principles that could guide governments in their actions. Um, I might turn to Professor Kalen if he wants to say some of the impact that, that that's had. Yes, Professor Kalen, please go ahead. Well, uh, regarding the impact, um, it's really interesting uh, to see that uh, we got uh, some traction with um, the International Law Commission. The International Law Commission is a body, uh, an organ of the United Nations. Um, having the task of codifying and progressively developing international law. And they uh, get uh, their uh, tasks basically from the General Assembly. And they have drafted many of the really important uh, international conventions, um, even uh, 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 Convention on the Law of Treaties, et cetera, et cetera. They um, decided um, building on our work to, um, as a first step, do a study on uh, the protection of persons um, uh, uh, affected by, by sea level rise. We will have um, next year, 22, a first report, and uh, that's a beginning. So in a way, um, the good thing is that uh, we managed to get it now into a kind of official process. Having said that, of course, um, it will be a very difficult uh, endeavor, very political, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's why what we both said about what's happening at country level state practice is uh, so important. I think regarding um, protection for uh, people displaced in the context of um, climate change, um, consensus has to be built up bottom up and based on experiences, based on what is actually happening. And I think only through that in the end, we will get the kind of legal frameworks we uh, uh, really need for protecting these kind of people. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. We're, we're running out of time. I wanted to get one more question in for both of you, if, if, you, if you have a moment, a couple, maybe to, even if we have to go a minute or two over, but um, uh, you, Professor Kalen, I'm going to start with you. You mentioned um, a lot of different agreements, whether it be in the Horn of Africa or Central America, about free movement agreements and, and other such uh, developments that are that you mentioned are in the right steps in the right direction. Um, could you, though, briefly maybe summarize a couple of the uh, um, uh, the most significant institutional developments in this field in the past ten years, let's say? Okay, uh, happy to give you the list. <laughs> Thank you. The guiding principles on internal displacement, uh, 1998, recognizing that uh, IDPs can also be people who are displaced in the context of uh, disasters. And the adverse effects of climate change are disasters, no doubt about that. Uh, 2010, the Cancun um, 
uh, climate change adaptation agreement, uh, recognizing um, human mobility, including displacement as one of the key challenges. 2015 Paris Agreement, setting up a task force on climate change and um, displacement, which has um, come up with recommendations that have been supported by uh, one of the previous COPs in uh, Poland two years ago. The Sendai Framework 2015 on disaster risk reduction for the first time, uh, integrating human mobility displacement into the disaster risk uh, reduction, the Global Compact on Migration, uh, recognizing uh, the need for uh, pathways for solutions for people who are displaced and cannot go back because adaptation is not possible in the country uh, of uh, origin and then all the regional initiatives I said. That's a lot. But what is really important is a relatively high degree of policy coherence. And that's quite unusual for international processes. It's all siloed. IHL is very siloed. They don't talk really to human rights and uh, migration, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But here, if you're looking at all the different uh, documents I just mentioned, it's very, very similar messages. And despite all the shortcomings we have, and I mean, we have, I have to highlight the shortcomings. It's not like I'm just happy, even though I was uh, focusing on, on progress made. But despite of all of that, that's to me the biggest achievement that um, we have a process and uh, we have a process uh, that um, goes across uh, all the different uh, international processes and comes out with, as I said, very similar messages. Well, thank you for, for that, uh, Professor Kalen. That's incredibly interesting and a good, a good way to sort of, I feel like, um, you know, bring this conversation to an end, which is like that just to notice the progress and understand the flaws and um, because this is existential. And um, I wanna, I'm gonna end with Professor McAdam. Um, last month, the Biden administration released its long awaited report on how the US should respond to movement in the context of climate change. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it recommends and how important the report is generally? And before you do, I want to mention you have an excellent piece on this subject, and I'm going to I'm going to drop the link. Oh, you've already did. Oh, that's you dropped the report, not the piece. I will drop the piece uh, in the chat uh, before you beat me to it. Um, but also, thank you so much for answering those questions. Really appreciate it. You're a better multitasker than I. And yes, please can you can you comment on this? Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Well, I mean, this report was really significant. I mean, just simply because you've got the US saying climate migration is an issue. People are already moving away from the impacts of climate change and they're going to continue to do so. What are we going to do about it? So I think we can't underestimate the significance of that for a start. But more importantly, um, the report recognised that migration is um, an important form of adaptation to the impacts of climate change and sometimes an essential response. The other thing was that it was framed as a compelling um, in the US's national interest to strengthen protection for people um, displaced by the impacts of climate change. And to that end, it was recommended that the United States establish a new legal pathway for humanitarian protection for people facing serious threats to their life because of climate change. Um, and not only temporary pathways are needed, because I think that's been one of the the stumbling points is that to some degree states have recognised, okay, we need to give temporary protection, but here the US is saying it has to be permanent sometimes. Um, and, you know, I think the report's been criticised by some as being a bit short on, on detail. Um, and that may be so, but I, as I said, I don't think we should underestimate how important it is that we now have this report, particularly because of the global influence it could have as well, uh, encouraging other countries to look at their own migration policies. Um, one of the other things that the report recommends is the creation in the United States of a new standing interagency policy process on climate change and migration. And one would hope that, as Professor Kalen said, where at the international level we now have very consistent messaging coming across all different areas that were once siloed, if that interagency group can take a, a holistic approach, um, an integrated approach, then that too would be a fantastic development to see. Okay, great. Well, I, I think that the, 
some, I think, I think optimist, I'm going to just call it optimistic notes that we uh, ended on is, is a good way to end. I want to thank you both. I just want to bring it back to the introduction where I explained all that is on both of your plates uh, for joining us today and uh, explaining some of these vitally important issues and issues that are going as vital as they are now are just getting more and more important. So thank you both for your time, professors McAdam and Kay Professor Kalen. I, I it so, uh, I just really means a lot and, and I appreciate it. And I also wanna thank uh, the audience for coming because um, this is important to engage in. And so we have our experts, but we also need um, you know, our, our, our big audiences to, to try to understand these issues to really move, uh, move, the, move things forward. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank my IHL uh, team and also our returning family links team, our RFL, I, IHL and RFL teams for your, uh, both of those programs support in putting this on. Uh, thanks very much. Um, have, an, uh, have an excellent day, <laughs> Professor McAdam and Professor Kalen. I hope you have an excellent evening. Uh, thank you very so, much. Thanks, bye thank everybody. Bye. Bye bye. bye.